importance of American women want, and it's infuriating the international right to life movement. We are very, very disturbed. Um, this is the do-it-yourself abortion at home. For the pro-life movement, this represents a threat that they just simply cannot accept at the present time. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Orly Safer. I'm Harry Reisner. I'm Ed Bradley. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes. Inside this briefcase are the simple tools that enable your authorized Mercedes-Benz dealer to do what no other dealer in the world can. Used skillfully, these instruments can help negotiate no down payment, lower monthly payment lease terms on select models. Why drive anything else when a new Mercedes-Benz is more affordable than ever before? A new leasing plan on a new Mercedes-Benz for a limited time only at your authorized Mercedes-Benz dealer. Life doesn't stand still for a headache, so when you can't take five, take three. Maximum strength, anison three. Aspirin free, sodium free, caffeine free. When you can't take five, take three. Maximum strength, anison three. When fashion flair needs special care, try Woolers in your machine. From active wear to evening wear, whatever clothes need special care, trust Woolite in your machine. Woolite in your machine. It was one of the most compelling murder trials of the decade. The defense of Roswell Gilbert involved issues that reached far beyond the routine testimony and the presentation of physical evidence. Roswell Gilbert, age 75, was on trial for shooting his wife, Emily, to death. She was 70, she was suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and she was in constant pain from a degenerative bone illness. His lawyer argued that Gilbert had acted out of love. Morley Safer re-examines the defense of Roswell Gilbert. Was it an act of love? Yes. Well, love, yes. I loved her dearly, naturally. It was. The case attracted reporters from all over the world. The little Fort Lauderdale courtroom was jammed for the three-day trial. Clark will publish the verdict. So dramatic was this issue of love and age and murder that Hollywood bought the story for television. Please pass the verdict to the clerk. The clerk will publish the verdict. Roswell Gilbert was played by Robert Young, and both trial and movie came to the same conclusion. The defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged in the indictment. He was sentenced to life. Mercy or murder, the movie was called. About the murder part, there was no doubt. It happened here in their living room. Emily lay on the couch resting. Roswell Gilbert got one bullet, put it into his automatic pistol, and shot her. She was still breathing. He thought he'd botched it. So he went into his workroom, got another bullet, shot her again. Was it an act of murder or was it an act of love? In either case, one family's misery was the stuff of good drama or good docudrama. So good, perhaps, that somewhere between Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood, justice got lost. Gilbert's lawyer was Joe Varon, one of the most respected criminal trial attorneys in the state. Before the trial began, he'd made a deal with Gilbert. In lieu of fees, Varon would get a piece of any book or movie rights the trial generated. Gilbert says he made the royalty arrangement with Varon out of necessity. To me, I was getting insured, if you will. I, I don't have tremendous resources, and he was, I guess, was pretty expensive. So this was an insurance policy, and uh, his side of the agreement was to carry my case uh, all the way along the line of appeals and everything else if necessary. Now, four years later, a number of questions have been raised about the quality of the defense mounted by Joe Varon. Varon will not be interviewed but he has admitted that there may have been a conflict of interest, that the, quote, economic factor of the book and possible movie rights perhaps swayed my judgment in some critical areas, unquote. Varon also admits that his defense of Roswell Gilbert may have been weakened by his desire to have Alzheimer's disease and its consequences publicized, and said as much on the day of the verdict. What I try to do is... Uh have an awakening to the public, to the frailty in the law, and the deficiency that exists. But uh, 
apparently this jury wasn't courageous enough, in my opinion, to deliver the message. He was asking us to change the law, to send to send a message to the to the world. Well, that's all well and good, but at the same time, we had a a very forceful judge stating to us that it's not our job to change the law. We assembled five of the jury. While they still feel Gilbert should have been punished, Mr. Varon's defense tactic left them little alternative but to find him guilty in the first degree. And several of us talked about it. We were waiting for this big attorney to come in with something for this, for his client. And I, I just didn't feel he did right by him. And no time did the defense give us anything that we could go on that we could give this man a break. The prosecution maintained that Emily Gilbert may have been ill, but she wanted to live. The prosecution also says the only suffering Roswell Gilbert wanted to end was his own. But um, uh, Mr. Barron, the only defense he had for him, as they were saying, was to change the law, uh, you know, bringing Alzheimer's into the open, that it's a fatal disease. Well, what were the facts? Were there witnesses the jury did not get to hear? Would a clearer picture of the long and apparently loving relationship between Gilbert and his wife have affected the verdict. Among the people not called to testify were friends and neighbors of the Gilberts who would have described both the deterioration of Emily and the tenderness shown by Roswell. Larry and Pauline McGinnis lived down the hall. He thought she was the most beautiful woman in the world. And you imagine what he must have gone through. You know, I mean, he had to change her, her, her nappy, so to speak, give her an enemas, put on her pantyhose, put on her makeup. He had to floss her teeth. And this beautiful woman, I, I, I have no idea what he must have gone through. He had not been uh, to bed for four or five days before the, the, the shooting. He had stayed up with her and he sat beside her uh, night and day. That's right. And anybody, even a young man, mm -hmm. going through four or five days, they start to hallucinate sometimes. So uh, lack of sleep, lack of nutrition, lack of every support took its toll. He just, I think he had a it collapsed, so to speak. The McGinnises were never called. Neither was Libby Phillips, the Gilbert's next door neighbor. I, I really think that, that uh, Ross was under such a strain when he did it. I don't think he actually was uh, sane. I, I really think he, it was a nightmare, the life he put through the few days before this happened. He couldn't say no to Emily, and she, uh, she begged to die. And well, you, hold on, you say she begged to die? Oh, yes. She used to come in and sit in, our, in, in the den in our uh, apartment here. And uh, she'd, uh, my husband would be here and she'd say, you know, I'm just falling apart. Doc, can't you do something for me? I just don't, well, I'd like to end it all. Louise Arthur remembers how often Emily spoke of wanting to die. She told me in the period of three years at least, she said she'd start to tell me something and then she would go blank. And, oh, she said, Louise, I, I just wish I could die. Louise Arthur was never called. Varon claims the jury would be bored by too many witnesses. So he selected one, Jackie Rhodes. And I felt I was the least qualified witnesses of all because I saw them so little as compared to Pauline and Libby, they were neighbors. And I conveyed that thought to Mr. Varon at the time. He said, don't worry, Mrs. Rhodes. There's not a jury in this country that's going to convict this man. Would it have made any difference to you, do you think, had you heard from those really close, dear friends of theirs and neighbors who were so fond of them and say she was practically a vegetable or worse? I don't think anyone could have said that. They had been out to a restaurant several hours before the murder occurred. She now, a real ill person does not order off of a menu. The prosecution made much of the fact that Emily could go out to eat, but the jury never heard from Dawn London, a waitress who served the Gilberts several times a week. Well, she would order something, and when I'd bring it to her, she'd ask what it was, and she wouldn't remember what she had ordered. And how come you're the one who always seemed to serve them? The other waitresses found her, Mrs. Gilbert difficult to handle because she complained about she didn't order it. And they just rather not be bothered with any hassles. What was his attitude towards her? How did he treat her? He'd just tell her that it was something that she liked and he'd tell me not to worry about it. It was okay and he'd just smile. And there was the hairdresser 
who grew increasingly frustrated with Emily Gilbert. Agnes Seggi remembers a difficult, sometimes violent woman. Each time after I finish it here, many times I told myself, why I'm doing this? Why I go through this with her every week? And I was talk to myself, get myself ready to talk to Mr. Gilbert that this is it, I cannot do her hair anymore. But the way he would come in and sit and wait for her, I, I just couldn't say that to him. And to me, he treated her like a china doll. Joe Varon did not interview the hairdresser or the waitress, and neither was called to testify. Did he indicate what his strategy would be, how he would build his, his case for the defense? Not particularly. I, I might not have understood it if he had, frankly. <laughs> Some of the people who knew you best and, and knew your wife, yeah. neighbors in the building, yeah, yeah. next door neighbors, weren't even called. They were pretty casual about the whole thing, I thought. The question of premeditation is oh. central to this whole I wish somebody Try. could explain it precisely. I've read a lot of definitions, but... But, uh, forgetting the legal definition well, of premeditation, uh, <coughs> it was something that had crossed your mind, no. witnessing the suffering that was going on. Not really, not really. Look, when you get in, in that situation, you really don't think about the ultimate. You have hope. You have hope to the last minute, in spite of the medical prognostications, you know. I had hope. Did you do it to end her pain or to end your pain? Not to end my pain, no. No. My pain, I had no pain. Just despair, that's all. Perhaps the most telling piece of evidence never brought out of the trial, never uncovered by Mr. Varon, was the fact that just hours before the murder, Roswell Gilbert had gone to see his wife's doctor asking for help. The nurse, Marilyn Marshall, was alone in the office. It was approximately 11, 11.30 in the morning. Mr. Gilbert came running in. I could see he was very upset. He was very distraught. And he said, I've got to make an appointment to see the doctor today. We have to talk about Emily. I don't know what to do with her anymore. She's in a lot of pain. I'd like to see him after office hours. And I said, fine, Mr. Gilbert, come in about 5, 5.30, and the doctor will be able to see you then. And he left. I gather the pain was so severe that she couldn't even be touched very often. Yes, that's true. And how did he treat her? How was he? Mr. Gilbert was very sweet and kind with his wife. He treated her like a little child and i would remark to the doctor many times about how wonderful he was with his wife the patience he had did the lawyer ever come around and ask you or did an investigator for the lawyer ever come around never. and talk to you about the gilberts never had mr Barron said to you here is a man who has been spent years now making her up changing her the way one would change a baby brought in next door neighbors good friends who, who witnessed this dramatic change over the years uh brought in the nurse who said he was a saint took her she couldn't find her way from one end of the hairdressers to the other took her there sat with her and he presented this you're, as you're an not act saying just what a moment heard. but these are nevertheless are facts and there were witnesses do you think it would have changed your minds? I think if some of that evidence had come out, it would have mattered to me. Some of it did. He did say that he changed her and he made her up and helped her dress. But nobody said that he was a saint, that he had taken care of her so patiently, or the nurse said that he was so wonderful. That did not come out. He came across as a very cold, calculating man. I thought what they wanted to hear was the story straight out. And, uh, so... You mean without a lot of emotion? I guess so. I guess so. I, I was emotional on the inside, but, uh, you know, that surprised me that they said that, but anyway. Roswell Gilbert has hired a new lawyer, Brad Stark who's asking the Florida Appellate Court to grant Gilbert a new trial 
on grounds that Joe Varon's defense was inadequate. Mr. Varon had a conflict of interest which divided his loyalties between Roswell Gilbert and the preparation of that trial. That suggests that it was in Mr. Varon's interest to see that Roswell Gilbert was found guilty. To an extent, yes. Would I say that Joe Varon intentionally secured that man's conviction? No. The Sixth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution guarantees a defendant the zealous representation of a lawyer. Roswell Gilbert didn't have that. He had a man who was worried about literary rights, a man who was worried about educating the public, a man who was worried about making new laws, a man who demanded a speedy trial before he had formulated a defense. He didn't even have the time to, to hire an investigator, to take depositions, to find out what the state's case was, because he wanted to get the trial quickly to, to quote him, ride the crest of publicity, strike while the iron was hot, to further his cause of the literary rights. The point is he wasn't directing his energies to having Roswell Gilbert acquitted. Varon lost the case, but got the movie. MGM paid $50,000 for the story, of which Varon got 45000 Ironically, the movie may have made a better case for Roswell Gilbert's dilemma in 90 minutes than Joe Varon did in three days of trial. I've been agonizing over this for a month, officer. I was responsible for resolving this. The doctors couldn't do anything. I had to end her suffering. <laughs> Funny. What is? The golden years. That's what they call them when you reach my age. The golden years. Roswell Gilbert is serving a mandatory sentence of life in Florida. He will be eligible for parole in 20 years, about the time of his 100th birthday. You know, when I was your age, I'd be down at the railroad station watching the world come and go. Mm. Depot sign read W-A-U-S-A-U. -S -S know what that spells? Wassa. Ah, but do you know what it means? The business insurance experts. Okay, but in Chippewa, it means the faraway place. These days, Grandpa, it's only this far away. How did you get so smart? Runs in the family. <laughs> Today, Wassa means business insurance. This is a machine designed to make travel easier. American Airlines. No problem. You? I can check on that for no you, No trouble sir. at all. Right on time. Glad and I these are its most important parts. No problem at all, sir. Just no problem. Don't worry. We'll get it there. Yes, sir, the men and women no of American no Airlines. I can change that for you. No trouble at all. You have a good flight. Sir, committed to making right your trip no problem. something no special. No problem at all. No problem. Glad we could help. Now that you're 40, would it kill you to eat Kellogg's 40-plus brand flakes? Dad, this stuff's healthy. After 40, that stuff's no better than elephant puffs. Kellogg's 40-plus brand flakes. For you, after 40. Because if you need it, it's got the maximum level of fiber plus iron in one cereal. I hate it when you write. I've waited 40 years to hear that. <laughs> Kellogg's 40-plus brand flakes. After 40, everything else is just kid stuff. Next, a revealing bestseller about Cabot Cove dwellers starts rumors to fly and someone to die. Murder? Yeah. Jessica hasn't a clue in an episode all new of Murder, She Wrote. Monday. I dented the car. What? One member of this happy household is telling the truth. Mr. Matthews, I dented your car. Is it the live-in? Then. Candy! All right, can I have some? Nope, I just brought it along to torture you. It's Gus and Graham's Excellent Adventure. Heartland, right after live-in, Monday on CBS. Nobody ever said Texans were like everybody else. When hard times hit that state a year or so ago, about 700 of the hundreds of thousands of Texans who were thrown out of work in places like Dallas and Houston and San Antonio 
packed up everything that hadn't been repossessed and hightailed it out of there for, of all places, the Caribbean island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. St. Thomas, island in the sun. Beautiful blue skies, brilliant sunshine, lush palm trees, and sandy beaches. Hey, hey. But since the Texans got here, things have changed. There's Texas barbecue on the beach and cowboy music in the bars. Texas flags are everywhere, and so are the Texans. We got music for you right up to 2 o'clock, so don't go any place. It's the Mighty Whitey Calypso Show. We're going to start out today with one from Wadabli, the Banana Man. Nicky Russell, a popular disc jockey known as Mighty Whitey, was born in Texas but has lived here most of his life. And he's a charter member of the Texas Society. Yes, there's even a Texas Society. How many people have just arrived in the Virgin Islands in the last, uh, say, six months? <laughs> what began as a few expatriates getting together to compare chili recipes has turned into a bi-weekly social event where Texans come to rub elbows with fellow Texans, and they keep on coming. Estimates put the Texan population here at around 700. Not only have they come here, it feels like they're taking over. How are you, cuz? Red Hook Marina, owned by Texans. American Yacht Harbor. Gregory East Marina and Office Complex, more Texans. Everything from tour boats to juice bars. Texas owned and operated. One of the largest hotels on the island built with Texas money, and restaurants, one after the other after the other. Why here? Why, why St. Thomas? I mean, how did so many Texans end up here? It's beautiful. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, there, there are 50 islands down here that are beautiful. Well, this is part of the, this part of the United States. The economy down here is like the economy used to be in Texas. The uh, small businessman can start his own business and be successful here. It's not dominated by all the big companies. And that's the way Texas used to be. Right. It's almost like a, a, a pioneering effort in an in a, in a island that's been here for hundreds of years. But the real reason they came here is for jobs. I was a travel agent in Austin, and we lost our biggest account, so we all started looking. And what are you doing here? I'm a reservationist at one of the hotels here. I was an unemployed architect in Dallas. Now I'm an employed architect here on the island. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go over this table here. Well, I was in the real estate business in Texas for 18 years. In the last two years in Texas, there was no real estate business to, to have. And now I run a restaurant. Now you run a restaurant? Run a restaurant. Had you done anything in the restaurant business before? The only thing I knew about restaurants was eating at them, and I was eating in a lot of them. I mean, I was pretty good at that, so I figured it couldn't be that hard. <laughs> Hill Paddock left Texas two years ago with his creditors at his heels. He was the mayor of Conroe, a suburb of Houston. He'd also been a millionaire. Well, I made a lot of money, a lot of money. And then when it fell out, nobody had any money. The people I dealt with didn't have any money. I didn't have any money. The big guys in Houston didn't have any money. Uh, the banks wouldn't lend you any money. Now they want their money back. If you ain't got no money to pay them back, what are you going to do? Come to St. Thomas. Well, that's what I did. That was my choice. Everyone seems to have a different reason for coming here. But whatever the reason, when you add this many Texans to an island of fewer than 70,000 people, their impact is sure to be felt. I think that this island clearly has a carrying capacity in terms of numbers of people to give you a particular level of quality of life. Certainly. Are you at that capacity? Well, Over? that's a big, big fight right now, very controversial. Um, Dr. Laverne Raxter is the president of the League of Women Voters and a professor at the university here. Like many of her contemporaries, she doesn't like what is happening to her island. With the resources that we have now, we can't afford to really take on many more people and expect the infrastructure, the environment, or the kind of socialization that goes on to, to be very positive. Over the last 20 years, the population of St. Thomas has nearly quadrupled. Some say that in order to attract the tourist dollar, the island's only major industry, they've turned their backs on the problems that come with that kind of growth. Overcrowding is a major problem. When the cruise ships are in, you can barely walk on the streets of Charlotte Amelie, the capital. 
traffic jams are daily and horrendous. And that's not the only problem. On this island, where the government and the tourist industry are the major employers, most of the young people here can't get jobs. The Texans haven't had that problem. Hello, anybody aboard? Dick Hassler came here from Galveston four years ago and has been very successful. Started as a dock boy. In about three weeks, I was in charge of all the dock boys. And about four months later, they uh, made me manager. Boy, that's unusual progress. He had the advantage of networking Texas style. The man who hired him was a Texan. And now he's doing the same thing. One year when I was here, out of the seven people working for me, six of them were from Texas. And uh, most of them were right from my hometown, and I'd never met them before until they came down here. There is some resentment of outsiders at this point. Yes. But not resentment to say, don't come. Mel Plaskett is a real estate developer, and he's also a fourth-generation St. Thomian. The resentment has to do with competitiveness, with opportunity, with survival, with security. And all those things are threatened by a potential newcomer to the islands. Although Plaskett says he is acutely aware that most black islanders aren't sharing in what appears to be a thriving economy, he is still reluctant to paint anything but a positive face on his island. Tourist helicopter? Tourist? Tourist. Tourist. No. I mean, that's what you see here. You know. Fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Tourists flying around. There's nothing wrong with that. And I don't want to suggest I, that it... there's trouble in paradise. Is there? I, I, no, I, but there are problems in, in paradise. Does I mean, an islander own that helicopter? No. Is an islander flying that helicopter? No, but I hope that an islander is a co-pilot. Is he? I don't know, but this probably is... Probably not. This is, well, probably not. Then, this, uh, then there, see, we have an objective then. Co-pilot, pilot, owner. I mean, look at, at the top jobs in business here. Most of them held by... Islanders? No. Businesses? No. Hotels? Not one. Are they not happy because they're unemployed, or are they not happy because there are no opportunities? Back in Conroe, Texas, Dick Watson was the director of the Chamber of Commerce and president of the Lions Club. But last year, he lost his multi-million dollar construction business and came down to join his pal, Hill Paddock. He doesn't feel the Texans have added to the woes of the island. It's just like any place else in the world. There's going to be some people who are unemployed and disgruntled and unhappy. And if you listen to them, you can make a great story out of it, but it may not necessarily be the story. Let me ask you to think for a minute about all the conveniences that you left behind. You had all of the, the creature comforts, I, I would guess, that running a, a four and a half million dollar construction company would give you. Yeah. I mean. The BMW was paid for and the, you know, about the only cash out blow I had every month uh, was house payment. Big fancy house? Well, it wasn't a big fancy house, but it damn sure was comfortable. What about here? A uh, little apartment, basic. Hill? Well, I guess I missed some of the things that I had when things were going good. I missed my Cadillac. I miss my big bathtub. You know, down here, water's a scarcity, so you don't get to take a bath. I bathed this morning just for you. But uh, you don't get to take a bath. But you end up with a lot more time to do things of your own, you know, to be yourself, to find out who you are, to sort of regroup and refocus down here. And I think a lot of us are doing that. Do you think that a group of people like the Texans could be a positive force here? I mean, could use their... You got people people who have uh, managed large companies, sure. uh, done well in the states, and sure. who have come here with their skills. Could they be a positive force? Here? I think so. Uh, I think what a couple of things need to be in place. Number one, if people want to to so-called help, they need to look at the kind of level where help is needed. There's a lot of money on this island that leaves here, okay, and a lot of it doesn't come back into the community to help make it better. Because I think a lot of the people that are here are here for a short period of time, and they're going to pack up and leave. But in the meantime, they may have contributed to the problem. How many of you look at this as temporary? You'll be here for a while, and then you're gone. Not too many. Most of you... We're not being honest, either. <laughs> 
I don't know how many of us Texans will end up going back to Texas, but I think, I think a significant portion of us will, and I think the state will be better for it because we'll have learned other things. We'll have learned something, how to do something like run a restaurant instead of sell real estate. Uh, we can maybe break that cycle of oil and real estate and construction that's really killed the state. The Texans have come here to escape bad times, but their presence may be contributing to the hard times that already exist on this island. So while they benefit from their experiences here, who knows if St. Thomas will benefit from the Texans. I got a Caribbean soul that I can town car. It's still the roomiest luxury car sold in America. And that makes it perfect for those really long drives. Town car Mark 7 and Continental. Lincoln, what a luxury car should be. If you're a business spending over $120 a month in long distance services, and you think that you're saving 20 to 30% with another carrier, we want you to try AT&T Pro Watts. We'll waive the installation charges, waive the change charges, and if you're not satisfied and agree that we have the best value, price, and quality, at the end of 90 days, we'll pay to put you back on your other long distance vendor. You can save 10 to 38% on AT&T long distance. Call us, 1-800-222-0400. Sixty minutes, a CBS News weekly magazine will continue. She can't hear. Her mother won't listen. Now her child could pay the price for their silence. Marley Matlin, Lee Remick, Bridge to Silence tonight. A crisis too many marriages must face. I can't stay here and hurt you. You mean you don't want me at all? Stephanie Powers and David Burney, Love and Betrayal, Sunday, April 16th. This is CBS. Your car was lucky to make it through March. It's barely running, and your luck is running out. Volkswagen's financing assistance plan can help. Everyone has a deal for you, but nobody has a plan. Except us. Volkswagen's new financing assistance plan can help you save up to $1,500 on a Volkswagen. You took the boss to lunch today. The career is taking you places, but your old car refuses to. Luckily, your local Volkswagen dealer can help. Cadillac is celebrating the unrivaled success of the all-new DeVille and Fleetwood with National Cadillac Week, now through April 16th. Share the success of these distinctive Cadillacs that outsell the Lincoln Continental and Town Car combined. See your Cadillac dealer during this special week and discover why there's so much cause for celebration. See your local Southern Cadillac dealer. News anchor Richard Belcher, only on Channel 5 Eyewitness News. Are you 486, the abortion pill? Nothing has been so welcomed by pro-choice forces. They made that apparent as tens of thousands of them marched today in Washington. And nothing is being so bitterly fought against by those on the other side. RU486 is a new chemical compound developed by Roussel Yuclave, a French pharmaceutical firm. And because it has triggered such emotion for and against, Roussel Yuclave now refuses to make it available to the world, despite the fact that it costs them millions to develop. It is sold only in France, where Roussel Yuclave distributes it to authorized clinics only because the French Minister of Health ordered them to. How widespread is its use? Already, 15% of French abortions are being done with RU486. One of the places where the pill has been most used in France, one of the places it has been most used anywhere in the world, is at the abortion clinic of Brousset Hospital in Paris. Operating under rigorous controls, 
The staff here has given RU486 to more than 1,100 women over the past five years. Dr. Elizabeth Obeni, who runs the clinic, says they have had no serious problems at all. So it's a fairly simple undertaking. Yes, yes. Pain, yes. Painful? The RU alone, not painful. Very nice. It works very nicely, not painful. A woman can take the pill up to 35 days after conception, so establishing the date of conception is key. The three pills of RU486 are usually taken at the clinic. The compound acts by preventing the egg from attaching itself or remaining attached to the wall of the mother's womb, depriving it, as it were, of a nest, thus cutting off the blood supply to the embryo. But taken just by itself, the pill is effective only 85% of the time. So two days after taking the pills, this woman, her name is Pascal, returns to the clinic, this time for an injection of prostaglandin. And then she waits, in most cases, for three to four hours, as the prostaglandin provokes cramps. And in this case, after only two hours, it causes Pascal to expel the egg. There was no surgery, no anesthetic, and very little pain. Not painful at all, perhaps a little at the beginning, like when you are expecting your period, but it is a pain you are familiar with, so it is not frightening. Are you in favor of abortion? No, we are not for abortion, we are against abortion. But, says Dr. Aubigny, since French women have the right by law to an abortion, it's the doctor's duty to help them. You are successful? Nearly every time, in my own experience, about 95% of the time, in fact. Under the rigorous French program, out of pure scientific caution, before taking the pill, a woman must sign an agreement saying that she understands that if the RU486 prostaglandin method does not work, and she does not then return for a normal abortion, she risks giving birth to a malformed child. And that worries Dr. John Wilkie, head of the International Right to Life movement. You've said, there's a significant probability that RU486 could even dwarf the thalidomide tragedy. This could be a chemical time bomb for babies. Correct. I can only postulate. But this is truly chemical warfare on the unborn that may come back to haunt us in 20 years. Right now, says Wilkie, RU486 may be tightly controlled in France, but ultimately it's going to get out to local drugstores around the world. Wilkie worries that not enough is known about the possible effect of RU486 on the baby since the pills don't work effectively to abort 100% of the time. You don't quite give enough or it doesn't quite work. And what you've done is given a, an extremely toxic drug that has prevented part of the normal formation of this child. Now, if this woman then carries to term and delivers, she's going to have a thalidomide-type baby a baby with stumps for arms, with grossly deformed organs inside. Some of them are going to live tragic little memorials of a foiled attempt at abortion. Dr. Wilkie, that's, that, that's quite a charge. That's tough words. But I have had one unofficial report of a baby born in Paris with gross deformities of its two legs. After the mother took RU486? Correct. But those who back RU486 say that Dr. Wilkie's alarms are not supported by research. That there is no evidence that in the case of the malformed fetus, which was aborted, not born, there is no evidence one way or another that it was malformed due to RU486. And scientists also say there is no evidence to back up Wilkie's other charge, that RU486 could provoke cancer in women taking it. It's one of the safest drugs which has been devised. Professor Etienne Beaulieu, the man who developed RU486. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of women now which can testify. We do not see at the present time specific danger coming from that drug. Either to the mother or to the child? Either to the mother or the child in case of failure of the drug. Dr. Sheldon Siegel is an embryologist with the Rockefeller Foundation. He has been monitoring studies and tests of RU486 worldwide for several years. Up to now, there have been no serious side effects that anybody has seen from this? That's correct. Now, the number of, of fetuses that have survived and delivered uh, at term among human 
subjects. After taking our U486. Yes, after taking our U486, is very low. So it cannot be said unequivocally that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no risk. That's going to take a much longer period of use before some evidence on that can be obtained. It will happen, as sure as we're sitting here. It's right there. In your own literature, you say, have any of these things been proven? Not yet. Not yet. I accept that. But those who are pushing the drug and saying it's the greatest and safest thing since sliced bread, they cannot prove that it will not. Of course, what fuels the opposition of the anti-abortion forces to RU486 is more fundamental than just suspicions that the product may be hazardous to health. I think uh, it's a last bastion for them, really. Mm -hmm. Well, right now they can focus upon the abortion clinic. They can protest, they can threaten, they can bomb. But when you have a method that a woman can use in the privacy of a doctor's office, or perhaps sometime in the privacy of her own home, that's a very different situation. And I think that for the pro-life movement, this represents a threat that they just simply cannot accept at the present time. We are very, very disturbed. Um, this is the do-it-yourself abortion at home. As we said, RU486 is only used up to 35 days after conception. But as can be seen in this picture, taken at about that time, a tiny embryo less than half an inch long has begun to develop. And aborting it, says Dr. Wilkie, is murder. And he drives his point home by playing a tape recording of the throbbing of the developing vascular system, what he calls the heartbeat of a tiny embryo. Now, you know what happens when we let a woman know that at five weeks of pregnancy there is a heartbeat and let her listen to it? Overwhelmingly, I mean 90% of those women are going to say, well, if there's a heart beating, I use her words, my baby is alive her word, then I can't kill my baby. Well, with this, give the woman the pill, she goes home and she takes it. Okay, she knows in taking it that she killed her own baby. What you're doing when you believe that just a collection of cells at the beginning are already a human person is just wrong. Well, this is, As Professor this is Beaulieu wrong. sees it, what is really behind the views of the right to lifers is ignorance. They are just ignorant of what is life. They are ignorant of modern biology. They are ignorant, probably, of the suffering of women all over the world, and especially in poor countries. He says that your position is born of ignorance. How absolutely ridiculous. I am giving you the simple scientific facts of biology. There is no question about when human life begins. It begins at the beginning. There is a question about whether laws will protect human life from the beginning. There lies the argument. And that is exactly the argument that Dr. Edward Saki is, the man who runs the Russell Uclave Company, the company that produces RU486. That is exactly the argument he wanted to stay clear of. We just developed a compound, that's all. Nothing else to help the, the woman. Nothing else than this. We are not in the middle of an abortion debate. But of course, that's where they wound up. Now let us talk about RU486. It has no other proven function except to kill a developing baby. Last year, the Right to Life forces in France launched a major campaign against RU486 and Bruxelles Uclave. And that troubled some of the people working for the company. The people working in the group, uh, going back home on the evening, they were asked by their children, is, is it true that you are uh, killing the babies, etc.? We understand there were some handbills distributed here in Paris, as a matter of fact, at the uh, Russell Uclaf plant, calling oh. RU486 a chemical weapon. Exactly that would poison the still tiny children of a billion third world babies. The anti-abortion forces also directed their fire toward the West German company that controls Russell Club. No one on the inside wants to talk a good deal about it, but what probably tipped the scales against RU486 were not the views of the French executives of Russell Club, but the fears of Russell's major stockholder, the giant German conglomerate Hext, 
headquartered here in Frankfurt. Hext executives declined an on-camera interview. They also want no part of the dispute. After all, at best, our U-486 could never represent more than a tiny fraction of Hext's huge worldwide chemical output. In fact, Hext's chairman himself is personally against abortion. Yet here was Hext facing charges that our U-486 is some kind of a new German-made death pill. They called you assassins, turning yeah. the uterus into a death oven. Exactly. As the controversy grew, Roussel said that they were suspending distribution of our U-486. Two days later, the French Minister of Health ordered it back in distribution in France. The drug is not just the property of Roussel Euclid, he said, but of all French women. But immediately afterwards, in an attempt to appease the anti-abortion movement, Roussel Euclid announced the drug would be distributed only in France and nowhere else in the world. Some people will worry that if the third world gets hold of this pill, who knows what's going to happen, that, that it will be used indiscriminately, overused, dangerously used? There are now in the third world over 100,000 deaths a year because of botched abortions. If those women have access to medical services, which make it unnecessary for them to go into back alleys for unclean abortions, that's going to save lives. It's not going to be damaging to their health. In fact, the Russell decision was a major blow to many countries which had been conducting tests on the pill. China, most of all, desperately trying to deal with a huge population problem. Dr. Wu Yu Ming has been conducting tests with the pill for the past three years. Now, after Roussel's decision, she finds her supply totally cut off. Every day, have the patient to come to the clinic to ask for RU486. But now, we have no RU486 at hand. You know I just important. hope I can get some RU486 at hand. If Roussel and Hex thought that by restricting RU486 only to France, they might somehow defuse the anti-abortion attack, they were wrong. In Germany, it was legal to kill a Jew. And so today, Roussel E. Clamp says, it is legal to kill unborn babies. Last month, the board of the International Right to Life Federation called for a boycott of Herxt and Roussel. We continue to hold Herxt and Roussel E. Clamp directly guilty for the drug being sold. You and I know, though, that somehow these pills will find their way to the black market eventually. I hope that doesn't happen for I know a long that time. you hope that it doesn't happen, but chances are... If there is a serious attempt to constrain further progress and further knowledge about this drug, then it is likely that a black market manufacture and supply system would develop. Is RU486 eventually going to make its way to market in the United States? I think not. I think it will self-destruct before it could go through the lengthy process of testing and licensing in the United States. I think before that time comes, you will have reports of women dying in third world countries from bleeding, and you will have pictures of tragically deformed babies in newspapers. And I want to tell you, when that happens, try to get a drug company to sell that drug. They wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But the fact is that other compounds, other pills similar to RU486, are now in the process of development by other pharmaceutical companies here in the United States and around the world. To understand Asia, you have to understand its customs, its mystery, its people. You have to know what makes a good impression and what offends. For over 40 years, we've been learning about Asia. So in addition to our convenient schedules, we can give you something no other U.S. airline can. The knowledge that comes after 40 years of helping people do business in Asia. These folks are all champion gardeners in the Guinness Book of World Records, and they're teaching these kids about gardening. Water it regularly, and don't forget the miracle Grow. My mom uses miracle Grow on everything. That's because miracle Grow gives her lots more flowers and vegetables. And bigger ones, too. miracle Grow helped me grow the biggest pepper in the world. Hey, if world champion gardeners depend on miracle Grow, shouldn't you? 
Now the miracle grown no clogged feeder. So easy, you'll feed your whole yard in minutes. This compact machine is blindingly, dizzyingly fast. Look, if we reduce the drag, what, 0 0.3? 0 0.3 is good. Compact, it's the muscle car of computers. Now, let's make it a convertible. One convertible coming up. Compaq has emerged as a leader as well as an innovator. What's the rest of Detroit going to think? They better think fast. Last year, I put my money in CDs and money market funds, and I did well. But now I'm paying for it in taxes. I could have gotten almost the same interest from a Nuveen tax-free bond fund and not paid a penny in federal income tax on it. Well, this year, I'm calling Nuveen. It's not what you earn, it's what you keep. For information on Nuveen tax-free investments, call your broker or financial advisor or 800-372-1500. Andy Rooney didn't show up for work last Monday, and wouldn't you know, it just happened to be opening day at the ballpark. It was good to see President Bush throw out the first ball on the opening day of the baseball season Monday. Looked pretty good. President Bush invited Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak to sit with him at the game. They don't play baseball in Egypt, of course, and Mr. Bush had to explain it. You couldn't hear what Mr. Bush was saying, but here's the way I imagine it went. There are nine players on each side, Hosni. The pitcher throws the ball over the plate. They eat while they play, George. Well, it's not really a plate, Hosni. They just call it a plate. See, each man gets three swings trying to hit the ball. George, that was five swings he took. Now, the swings don't count until the pitcher throws the ball. When a player connects his bat with a ball, you know, strikes it, it's called a hit. What happens if he misses, George? If he doesn't strike it, it's called a strike. If he doesn't strike it, it's called a strike. Let's watch the game, shall we, Hosni? Now, what was that, George? That was a ball. If the pitcher doesn't throw the ball over the plate, it's called a ball. So now we can go home. When a man gets a hit, he runs to first base, and if he gets there before the ball does, he's called safe. What if the ball gets there first, George? Then the man is out. Out of game? No, Hosley, not out of the game. Just out, you know, just out. He's out. We go home. Let's just enjoy the game, shall we? What was that? That ball went outfield. Does he have to pay for ball, George? That's what we call a home run. A home run? I'm going to walk home, George. No run. Say, Hosney, do me a favor, will you? That Senator Nunn, a Democrat down there in the cheap seats, just wave to him for me, will you? Thanks. Look, George, there's our car. Now we all go home. Well, I don't really know how it went, of course, but that'll teach Mubarak to come here the opening day of the baseball season. Maybe he can get back at President Bush if Mr. Bush ever goes to Cairo by taking him to a camel race. I'm Ed Bradley. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. You're looking for a hay fever product that doesn't make you drowsy. You look can look. It can be very confusing. All those products, all those ingredients, all those claims. You just can't seem to find something that's right for you. It's very confusing. See your doctor and end the confusion, because now you can get fast relief from all your hay fever symptoms without the drowsiness you may have had before. See your doctor. Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> The moment. It is born of the things we live for. And sometimes made of the things we live through. So whether it's the moment you need cash, or the moment you've been waiting for, you can count on MasterCard. In nearly three times the number of places as American Express. Wherever you happen to be, from sea to shining sea, MasterCard. Master the moment. At UPS, we're changing the look of the international delivery business. Because now, UPS delivers to every country in Western Europe, the Pacific Rim, Down Under, and Canada. 
And because we're so efficient, we can deliver your international parcels and documents for fewer francs, yen, or drachmas than other companies charge. An accomplishment we feel deserves a little flag waving. UPS, we run the tightest ship in the shipping business. When a cartoonist makes fun of Murphy Brown... Your lips like some giant plunger. Is she the picture of self-control? <laughs> then, get ready for Charlene's wedding when a southern belle marries her beau. Catch Designing Women. And on Newhart, when the prescription's passion, will Michael respond? Well, to put it in his words, I don't Peter his O'Toole. Then... Mr. Everly, try these meatballs. When a food critic reviews Kate and Alley... Daryl Everly dies of food poisoning! It's all Monday... Decides when a mother is unfit. Academy Award winner Marley Matlin in her first speaking role, and Tony winner Lee Remick star in Bridge to Silence later tonight on the CBS Sunday Movie. But first, when a tell-all book about Cabot Cove hits too close to home, the reviews turn deadly on Murder She Wrote. Next, we got music for you right up to two o'clock, so don't go any place. It's the Mighty Whitey Calypso Show. We're going to start out today with one from What Dobbly, the Banana Man. If you ain't got no money to pay them back, what are you going to do? Come to St. Thomas. Well, that's what I did. That was my choice. I think that uh, everybody... Most important, most of you are listening intently. For a printed transcript of this or any edition of 60 Minutes, send $4 to Transcripts, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 10007.